for Michael Beck. Alright, this is a pleasure. So we're going to dive right in because time is short and everybody has other things to do. But uh, we want to dig right in and um, give as much attention as we can to uh, uh, Mr. Beck. So tell us what have you been doing recently? Well, what I do uh, recently and for the last, uh, well, the last 30 years, but a lot more in the last, say, five years, um, I narrate audio books. Uh, John Grisham, uh, you know, the best-selling author, John Grisham. Uh, since 1991, I've done well over half of his books, probably 25 or 30 of his books, and other authors, and uh, I, there's a studio near where I live that I <clears throat> probably work in, oh, three days a week. Uh, I, last year, narrated uh, an updated translation of the New American Standard Bible. So that is probably the wow. best, that, that's the most, best-selling book of all time. <laughs> the one that I'm most honored and humbled to have done. But yeah, that's what I do most of the time. Don't work too much in film anymore. Well, I, that's amazing. That, I actually did not know that. Yeah. That's amazing. Do you, you are gifted with an amazing voice. Well, that's kind of you say so. Do you, do you work on your voice? Uh, well, I, when I started out as an actor, after I left college, I went to drama school in, <clears throat> in London. And it was a stage training, not you know, a film school training. So they, you know, every day for three years you did voice and movement, so you, it becomes innate after that. All those muscles work because you trained to make them. That, that really does explain a lot. And then um, segueing into your film work, was that, was film a goal? And then we'll get to Xanadu super quick, but was film a goal after Shades then, or? Well, you know, I think film is, you know, I grew up like all of us did, watching movies, going to movies, watching television. I grew up on a farm in Arkansas, so there wasn't a whole lot of theater, you know, out there other than the theater of reality, of, you know, driving a combine or, <laughs> disking or harrowing or whatever what needed to be done, but, um, you know, I did theater, I got into acting in college, and went to a small college in Mississippi uh, as a football player, as a football scholarship, so acting was not something that I had, even though I had been acting all my life, <laughs> in right. reality, uh, not on the stage, and, uh, you know, a couple of friends dared me to try out for a play in my junior year. And I took the data, tried out for the play, got the role of Tiffles and Romeo and Juliet, and never looked back. So, wow. You know, so That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Let's jump to, um, they call this a Xanadu Spotlight, so we have yeah. to hit that. And make sure. And all you Warriors fans, you'll get your question. You will get your, you'll get your shot. I uh, guess that's who I am. So, uh, Xan, how did that even happen? Did audition after a, like, was it a callback situation? No, not at all. <clears throat> I have done the Warriors uh, the year before. Right. We filmed it in 78, it was uh, released in 79. And Lawrence Gordon, Larry Gordon, was the producer of um, the Warriors. Uh, and Joel Silver was his assistant at that point. And then Joel moved up to an executive producer on Xanadu, so Larry Gordon was a producer of Xanadu. And so they were, you know, casting in Hollywood. I still lived in New York at that point. And I, you know, I think a lot of people had gone and auditioned for that part, but they hadn't found the person that they wanted for the part of Sonny Malone. And my agent called me one day and said, um, uh, Larry Gordon's called and they, they not auditioned, they want you to play Sonny Malone. So I read the script. And you know, guys, if you've seen Xander, you know that I'm not the next Gene Kelly. You know, it's, it's you know, Warriors is, I'm more comfortable with playing Spawn than doing a, a musical fantasy. So I read the script and I said, you know, tell them thank you very much, but you know, I, I just don't think that that's 
what I do best. So uh, they called back again, uh, and I turned it down a second time. Wow. Uh, you know, which was, you know, my age is going, are you crazy? And I'm like, you know, I just, what can I tell you? I just don't feel like this is in the wheelhouse of what I did best. And then they came back a third time, and my agent said, <laughs> I'm going to leave you if you don't take this. Oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> I'm teasing. But, uh, you know, I, I had Larry, I talked to Larry, he said, you know, come out here and do this thing. So, so I did. You know, and I'm so thrilled that I did it. I got to, you know, growing up, growing up on a farm in Arkansas and transitioning years later and sitting on a beach in a, you know, the director's chairs between takes and talking to Gene Kelly, that's you know, a surreal thing. You know, you know, seeing the range one of probably my favorite musical. So it was uh, you know, it was a treat and Olivia, I mean you know, it's just, all of us were and are still in all the, you know, with Olivia. Uh, and saddened as all of you are who love her and her, and her music and her performances at her recent passing. But I get to say to you that, uh, you know, people come up at conventions and wherever, and they always ask, what was Olivia really like? And I get to honestly say, she is exactly who you want her to be and uh, who you expect her to be. Kind, generous to a fault, funny, uh, hard worker to do anything for you, just a totally down-to-earth, real person, you know. Uh, and that's not always true in, in the business I work in. No, I'm a lady, but it's not always, it's not true in any place in life. We all work with people that we go, gosh, I can't wait to change jobs. But anyway, anyway she's, she's just a wonderful, wonderful person that I'm privileged to have known and to Call friend. Thank you very much for that. That's that's a very special memory. Um, the one last maybe this is alive. The one last um, uh, uh, Xanadu question. What was a, 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 a memory that you won't forget from that like that experience? Um, oh, and Olivia related or not, is there anything else you you just recall that is just you'll never you'll never forget? Well. You know, told people this before when they asked. You know, um, I would say one of the most indelible experiences on that, and there were many, but um, I still lived in Manhattan back in New York when I did this movie. So I was on location, and we, you know, wrapped the filming for the Thanksgiving break. And Gene was on the set one day, you know. You know, two or three days, four days, five days before we were going to be back for Thanksgiving. And he, and he turned to me and said, Mike, I know that you, you live back east. Uh, my wife and I and my family would love for you to come spend Thanksgiving with us. You know, so I will always remember that Gene Kelly invited me to wow. spend Thanksgiving with him. But I'd already accepted Thanksgiving with my mom and dad back in Arkansas, so that's where I went. <laughs> No regrets. And I know you Utahns will, will appreciate that. Family is, yeah. 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 That's my family, dude. Yeah. Family first, you're right. But, you know, Gene Kelly asked me that. Pretty good. Did your parents know you chose that? Oh, they did later. I did not bring that to That's a good question. Nor did I just say thank you, Gene. But, you know, I, I have some family plans. All right. Well, there you go. There you go. Um, so, uh, Xanadu was real quickly after such a different movie as the Warriors. Uh, what did that do for you in regards to the characters? Couldn't be any different. The movies couldn't be any different. Whereas the, the experiences different from just a year prior. I know it was filmed before it was released. Well, they were totally different um, experiences. Uh, the thing I found about Xanadu that was the hardest um, is, you know, every actor has their own process of how they come to a role uh, in doing their homework before they get there, etc. Xanadu, in its a 
original conception, there were, I think, three movie roller skating years. Those of you who are old enough out there will remember in the late 70s, roller disco, it was a, you know, it was a fad that was happening. So, <clears throat> Xanadu was initially to be a low budget exploitation, exploiting that fad, and there were like two other movies, Roller Boogie, I think was one of them, and some other book, I can't remember the, the other one. So they, they were all getting in line to be the first out there, and for some reason, I don't know how, Larry and, and Jewel Sober, I'm sure, for the reasons, Olivia got attached to this movie. So then it grew from being a low-budget exploitation movie about roller skating right. into something that was totally different. And the original script was really a good script, you know, I, I, I thought. Um, still the same, you know, story of, you know, Sonny and Kira, but um, as we progressed in the filming of it, for whatever reasons, the producers, like in lots of movies, they start changing things. So it was my first experience in film, or really in anything, because I was pretty, I'd done, you know, The Warriors, and I'd done an independent film in Israel prior to this, so this is my third time out doing a movie. And, I mean, after about the third or fourth week, we started getting revisions as thick as this on a Monday, you know, I go, so you, you know, I'm this kind of actor who I've already worked through who this guy is, and I'm going, he wouldn't do that, what is that? You know, so it was then, a, you know, kind of shooting from the hip, it was a whole new kind of experience of, you know, you kind of just throw everything out the window, and uh, you rely more on the skeleton of what you've done, and and personality more than you know right. this character that map that most act actors draw which they throw away anyway right. but it gives them a kind of at least you know footprints that they follow so that was hard that was the first experience i had of that as an actor of um, you know choices that i haven't said concrete because you don't do that but i had a kind of map of his emotional journey right. and it got thrown totally out the window a time and time and time again. Yeah. So that was you know that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Alright. Gotta move on to um, the was the Warriors more of was it more run and gun? Was it more of a um, that what was it not as structured as like Xanadu. Was it Warriors just um, more, it was night shooting? It was all night, wasn't yeah. it? Well, we originally, the introduction of the gang, the Warriors, took place in the daylight, and we shot probably two okay. weeks, you know, just on that interest of, you know, the audience met all the characters, and then, you know, as it became, late afternoon, early evening, we boarded the train. But they were cutting, they were editing the movie as we shot, so Walter Hill, the director, who was a marvelous director, uh, he and uh, the editor, they saw how this was shaping up and they said, all of this daylight stuff is not going to work. This movie needs to start at night. The only time you see daylight is when they get home and they have the last confrontation. So they reshot all those things of, you know, Cleon going where, we, you know, we're going up to the conclave, this, that, and these little pops of us. So you get an intro of us that is way different from what was originally shot. That's the only day stuff, with the exception of the end of the movie. Right. Everything else was, I think, 65 or 70 night shoots over the summer. And, you know, in New York, in the middle of the summer, it doesn't get dark till after nine o'clock, nine o'clock. Right. So, you know, we would get picked up at the Gulf and Western building and ferried in the many vans to the Bronx or Brooklyn or Coney Island or wherever it was we were shooting. And, uh, you know, we'd get there, we'd eat lunch. Right. Eat lunch at like, you know, seven o'clock at night and uh, put on our, you know, go to makeup and get you know, we were young and didn't need it, and it would sweat off in a hurry. You know, get, put our you know, uh, costumes on and didn't start shooting, get up 
of set up and then it would get dark and we'd start shooting and then, you know, by seven fires. Like, so, you know, they're pretty short shooting. You know, when you're talking about a lot of movies, you'll have a 12 hour day you can shoot. We were probably shooting nine hours, so it, right. it added more days to it. Um, so, what was your question? No, that was it. <laughs> the experience of, of, of all of this, this, basically this night shoot, and then, uh, you know, less than a year later, after release, of course, you're on a musical. Yeah. Well, so, it, 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 it was a very different kind of movie, and, and a different director. Walter Hill, when he, I mean, he's, he's self admits that casting to him, <clears throat> casting is the <clears throat> most important part of the process. Because he believes if he's cast the roles in his movies right, he doesn't have to tell those actors what to do. He knows that they know what to do because he cast them based on that intuitive and um, and their audition and you know piece. So Walter was very man of very few words and he was great to work with as an actor because he kind of gave you your hand. He let you develop the, <coughs> develop the character and you know if if you went off the rails he would you know kind of bring you back on but he was great to work with so that leads me to my next question, and you probably, this is not a creative question, but I have to ask. The chemistry between you and the Warriors and the Rogue Leader, did that, was that work to work with those guys? It seems like you've all had known each other for years, you know, and that was what you were, that was your job. And, and then I also wanted to piggyback off of the 2015 reunion, okay, last ride. So how did all that, that chemistry lasted to 2015 from what I saw. Well, I'm going to give Walter the credit there again because <clears throat> when, you know, when we started shooting the match before, when we started several weeks before, you know, choreographing fights and you know, all of this kind of stuff, and going to stunt, stuntman school, so you oh, learn how to throw a punch and take a punch, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, Walter had every crew member, you know, hair, makeup, wardrobe, grips, cameraman, everybody. We were all never called by our names. We were all from the get-go. I was Swan. Go get me Swan. Uh, where's Cochise? Get Cochise up. So he set it up to where we were not always like in character, but addressed on that, and he, he created an atmosphere for us to bond, and also because it, the Warriors was a low budget movie, it was not a big budget movie. It was, you know, that's why they cast, you know, unknown actors in it. Um, and, you know, so if it's a big budget movie, every actor has their own trailer that they're in, etc. So we shared the trailer with wardrobe and another trailer with makeup. So there were four or five of us, and one of them, and Deborah didn't want to feel left out, so she joined us. <laughs> you know, so there were, you know, there were half the crew was in one thing, and the other half. So that also, and I think that was probably not just budgetary, but I think that was Walter too. He was doing everything he could to take these young actors, put them in a situation where they became that gang, and trusted each other, and knew each other, and it worked. It works. 40-something years later because, um, you know, you're talking about the, the 2015, it actually the first time that we did a thing uh, around the 25th anniversary of it. So, uh, that there's a, there was a crew, a, a husband and wife who owned a, a, a franchise in Austin, Texas called Draft House Center, Apple Draft House Center. They sold it later, you know, the, the franchise, but it was an old, run-down, retro theater in Austin, and they did cool, crazy events. You know, they they would have this inflatable screen, and they would take it out to a venue, and all people would come to the Jaws, unknowing, and they were floating in inner tubes, watching the thing, unknowing that uh, scuba divers had been hired at the proper moments to go pull them underwater. These guys were great. I mean, they were just great. They did a thing in, what, 25 years later, what it would be, early 2000s, 2004, 
four or five or something like that. At the computer, where they had set up uh, for all the fans, all the fans had to dress in gang, their favorite gang, all the uh, people who were coming to the show, they were given a, uh, you know, a scavenger hunt right. deal that took them all the way up. So they went from location to location that were cool. in the film, and they had to come up and they could get stuff and bring it back, and then they got it all, all back to Cody, and you know, and we were the warriors were on stage and you know greeted them in the intro of the, the film and had a Q and A, uh, and and presented the prizes to the best gangs, the one that got the most right. clues, or the ones that you know it was really a cool event. That was when I first knew, <clears throat> that was the first time that I had seen, you know, I kept in touch with sure. several of the guys, uh, but that's the first time we had all been together again, you know, 25 years later. And that chemistry was still there, which was extraordinary, because that doesn't, I'm going to tell you the truth, that doesn't happen. You may make a friend that lasts three years with somebody that you worked with on a film, but a lot of times, it's just you have that kind of, you're forced into a kind of um, intimacy and you, then you skip. You just get there in a hurry because you have to, because cameras are rolling and you have to, you know, well, I've been married to this guy for the last 20 years, so all that history has got to be there when the cameras roll. So you get close in a hurry. Uh, and usually, you, some people, you, still maintain friendships with, but you, your lives go on and to do other films and meet other people. As a group of warriors, 40 some years later, we're still brothers have each other's yeah. back. And oddly enough, this is the weird part, and I found it really weird because it all falls on me. Swan still makes all the decisions. We're going out to dinner. What restaurant are we going to, Michael? Uh, you know, what, <laughs> it's like all the pecking order is still there. And I'm going, dude, where well, was You're 70 years old and so am I. What am I still making decisions for you for? You know, it's great. It's wonderful. Thank you for that. All right, um, time is short, so we can start lining up for questions. All right, quick question, go ahead. Uh, quick question. Um, so, Xanadu uh, was my comfort film when I was little because I was sick very much. And this is back in the time of VHS where you would have to rewind it and then play it again. So, thank you for making that silly little film that means so much to me. Thank you for speaking so lovingly about it. But, my father will never forgive me if I don't ask about the Warriors. When you were making it, did you realize what an important and impactful film it was going to be? Like, did you have a moment on set where you were like, oh, this is something special? No, no, I understand. We get asked that question, and probably Bogart and McCall didn't know that, uh, you know, <laughs> their movies were, be, you know, going to become uh, called. You know, there's no way of knowing that. If, you know, we, we were, like I said before, we're all young actors. For many, it was their first film. So we were just thrilled to have a gig, you know. Uh, and, you know, Larry Gordon, the producer, Walter Hill, nobody would have had any idea that this movie would become 40 something years later so beloved. And, uh, you know, what makes a cult movie, cult classic movie, is that moms, dads, older brothers, uncles, now grandparents, you know, turn on their kids and their grandchildren. So it skips generations, you know, because, you know, I'm going to be sitting at a table and today and I can tell you that there will be a 12 and 13 year old kid who will walk up and once you know, now I was like, so who turned you on to this movie? Because you didn't just find blockbusters out there, so you know, so, uh, and it's, it's all of you who have made this movie what it is. Um, you know, I think for me, uh, I had a friend who had gone to uh, Paris in the early 80s, probably 83 or 84, and he came back. And he said, you're not going to believe this. I was uh, standing on the street, and I looked, and there was this retro movie house, and there were all the warriors standing outside. So it started that kind of craze in France, for crying out loud. Uh, and then it caught on, you know. When the warriors opened, opening day, <clears throat> opening weekend for the warriors, we were the highest grossing movie 
when we opened. And then, you know, things happened. There were two or three incidences where gangs went to that movie and, some, you know, a couple of kids were killed. And, you know, it just, that blew into this thing where Paramount, you know, you know, for liability reasons and everything, they just pulled all the promotion. And after three weeks, this movie that was, could probably have been a hit movie, you know, in the terms that those are judged, was just went into oblivion. But people found it, you know, with HBO and VHS and things like that, and it became a cult movie. You know, there's no way anybody could go, oh yes, I can see the, I can see that, I'm prophetic, I can see that that's gonna happen. No, we have no idea. But really glad that it happened. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I have two questions about the Warriors. Okay. Okay, the first one is the uh, death of, or Cleon dies in pretty dramatic fashion, but due to a contract uh, issue with the actor, um, what was the originally scripted uh, character arc for Swan and Cleon? And, and, this, and it's Swan and, and Cleon. Uh, and the second, was, no, the that, second question. What you saw was always scripted. Cleon, Cleon was always, Swan was always going to take over the role as war chief. So Cleon was, that was scripted in the first script I read. What is, you may have heard the other story, Fox, Fox on the Fox other Fox. hand, yeah. what, you know, Tommy Waits, Thomas Waits, a great guy. Um, he was, his character, the Fox, was in the original script, he and Mercy right. get together, and that thread, Swan is captured briefly, escapes from that, hooks back up with the guys, and still has the confrontation on, on the, you know, with uh, Luther. Uh, so there were two different streams that happened. Uh, and usually if there's a panel and all of us are here, uh, Thomas gets to tell his own story. But it, it would, Tommy had a, a difficult time for a number of reasons, and he made it difficult for himself. He would self-admit that now, uh, and have us in the, these very kind of settings, uh, with Walter and with Larry Gordon. And it just came to a point where they felt that something needed to be done, so Tom was, for lack of a better word, fired from the movie. Um, and he would, he would say to you right now, I made a fool of myself. I was, you know, made it difficult for people to work with me, uh, and I should have been fired. Uh, you know, and so I think what happened was that Deborah and, and, and I had, they had seen Walter and Larry, that there was chemistry on screen between the two of us. So they knew there was a route that they could take before making that decision uh, for, to let Tom go. So I think that may be, you know, those two stories together. Cleon was always, you know. And my second question had to do with the death of Fox, which obviously wasn't originally scripted, and uh, it happened during filming. You talked about Sanadu, about the difficulty of an actor receiving those kinds of changes during filming. What was your reaction to the whole Thomas Wade thing? Well, and the no, Della Fox? because I liked Tom, I was, and, and as were the rest of us, we, when, when Larry and, and um, Walter, and mainly Larry, since he was the producer, Walter, the director's kind of go, I'm not going to be kind of make this announcement. <laughs> but, when, you know, they they pulled us in one night on the set, you know, and pulled us over and said, you know, this is what's happening. And, you know, we weren't, all of us were aware of Tom's behavior, so it wasn't like, but that was a pretty drastic thing to happen. So we were kind of shocked, and because we were, you know, as I said earlier, formed into this kind of brotherhood already, you know, I don't think we were ready to go to fisticuffs with the director and the producer, but we were disappointed. And, and shocked, and they let that sit for a little bit so that we could take it in. And then, you know, um, I think Larry and Walter took me aside and said, and this is the path that's going to happen with, uh, you know, the love interest between Mercy Swan, you're going to do that. So, you know, I'm, okay. Um, 
And then, you know, I'm not immediately that night filming those scenes. So Deborah and I both talked about it. And, you know, it was a process that we had to go to get to that point uh, where we went, okay, this is, hey, this. But, you know, because of the, the nature of that movie, that kind of crazy chaos fit into, you know, we're running for our lives as a game. So you take it, you use it. You know, you, you just take, okay, and you process it and put it into the, this is the, this is not just, this is Swan's journey, but this is Michael's and Deborah's journey. Play these people in what's happening in real life. So you just take those things and hopefully they make the performance more real and better because they're real things that are kind of, you know, pick, you know, hitting you and you go, okay, this is just part of the deal, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, first off, thank you for being here. Um, you made mine on my sister's day yesterday when we came and got our mom's autograph on the vinyl record. Right? And she, she cried happy tears. <laughs> uh, but we agreed that this question should be asked. What was your favorite scene to do with Olivia Newton-John in Xanadu? Can you repeat Your favorite scene? Okay, my favorite scene to do with Olivia in Saturday. <laughs> I, I you, this was favorite because I have a very kind of uh, ironic sense of humor. Uh, I lived in, back in Manhattan, like I think I shared before. I was engaged uh, to my wife now of 42 years. We were engaged that way, so she <laughs> She, uh, so she came out to visit for a few days from New York uh, while I was shooting the movie. And um, she happened to arrive on the day that Olivia and I, or, or Sonny and Kira, kissed for the first time. <laughs> so, you know, and like I said, I have an ironic sense of humor. I thought, boy, I'm gonna really get in trouble on two fronts here, but I want to see how this plays out. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I went to the last minute and I said, Carrie, um, the scene that we're about to shoot is where Sonny kisses Olivia. Are you, do you really want to go in and watch this? And she went, no. <laughs> and I told Olivia, I said, you know, she had met her, like when we got there, I said, you know, this is my fiance, Gary. So Olivia immediately goes to uh, Joel or Larry, whoever was on the set that day. I want a closed set. Nobody comes on this set but Michael and I and the film crew because she didn't want to. She didn't want to kiss in front of you know the person that you know that I'm betrothed to. So that yeah, that's a fond memory. I you know I kind of laughed and. I never had any bad payback from Carrie, so that's a good thing. That's good. Thank you. No, she fell in love with Olivia, too. She you know, just the sweetest, sweetest person. So thanks for the question. Michael, I'm glad you're here. I... Of course, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Of course, I love Sam, too. <laughs> that's not fan <laughs> Um I understand that uh, he wasn't a real commercial success when it came out. Even Gene Kelly thought it was a little silly. Uh, you know, it was panned a lot when it first came out. It, it was actually, I heard where the soundtrack was actually first, one of the first times where it was more popular than the movie. You talked about Saturday, right? Well, Saturday, yeah. yeah. Uh, because uh, I understand, too, that you might not have been the first choice for the role of Sonny. And uh, can I smash one more question in? Sure, just get them all in. It, was the mural really totally there? Is that, a, was the mural really in the downtown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, it was there. It was, you know, the, the set, um, uh, scenic artists, they painted that. That was there. Wow. For sure. They should just leave it up for a tourist thing. You know? Pardon? I know, I should. I know, should. I should. I should. I should. I should. It, it was. It was probably not left up. No. Sometimes they will leave things up, like, like in the Warriors, there was there was a building down in Coney Island, which they painted, you know, the logo of the Warrior, you know, the sign of the Warriors on this building, and for decades 
that was still on that building. So when people who loved that movie would go down there, they would see it. And then somebody bought the building and you know kind of regentrified the, the area and it, it went. I'm not I can't remember. That was down in Santa Monica. And they're funky enough down there that they may have left it for a while, but I, I'm not sure. No, the first question what about the popularity of the movie that it just what didn't really it wasn't really that popular when it first came out. You know, oh, Xanadu? Yeah, it didn't say the money right at first. Xanadu was, uh, I think everyone was disappointed with the opening that it had. Uh, and, you know, for, you know, I think I was on record saying, <laughs> uh, you know, people were interviewing me in those days, it, you know, after the movie opened, and it just, it really bombed. Not the English term of a bomb, which is a huge success. It bombed when it opened. Uh, and I remember quoting, you know, somebody who had asked me, I said, well, uh, you know, I've done a, a couple of major motion pictures now. One put me on the path of, of you know, really having a career in this business, and the other put the brakes on it. But that's not been, that has not proven true, because both of those movies, for the same reasons, you people who love these movies found it, turned it, you know, introduced other generations to it. Both of them are called classic movies. And you know, Xanadu is, it has just such a wonderful theme to follow your dreams, to walk in the destiny that God has planted the footsteps for. Uh, and many of us get sidetracked and don't. So I, I love that message. And a lot of it, of course, was America's sweetheart. You know, yes, yes. Here, here, here the show. Yeah. yeah, we miss her. Don't we? Yeah. We want to. We want to get through a lightning round here yeah. in the next questions because we're we're we have to wrap it up soon. Okay, so real quick question. Super quick question regarding sanity. I just want to know: Did Gene Kelly give you any good advice for acting? It just seems like he had so much to offer. Did he share with you? Gene did not uh, give me the advice on acting. Uh, he looked at me do a couple of dance steps and he went, no way can I help this kid. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Hi, Mike. Hi. Thanks for coming. It was a highlight to meet you. Um, I was just wondering, and I apologize, I came late to this panel, if this has been covered already, but um, was there ever a talk of a sequel with the original cast? Was there ever approach back in the day for a sequel to the Warriors? To the Warriors? He asked if there was ever uh, plans for a sequel to the Warriors. And no, there was never any plans for, uh, that I've heard of, of doing a sequel, you know, something that happens after that story. Certainly Walter had no desire to do that. It was a one-off story. Uh, what did happen, there were two or three rumors, and I think Tony Scott, Ridley Scott's brother, uh, at one point really wanted to do a remake of the Warriors, but he wanted to set it in Los Angeles, and he wanted to kind of cast it with hip hop and rap um, actor singers. It, so it would have been a totally different kind of movie. Whereas, you know, and I know Mark sitting over here, uh, who, who is a New Yorker, it, this is a quintessential New York movie, The Warriors. You know, if you move it to some other place, it's, you know, and to do it now, uh, you know, it, how could you make that movie in 2022? I mean, you know, it would be maybe uh, with these things right here, uh, five seconds. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Thank you. Last question. Thank you. Uh, last two questions, real quick. Hi. Hi. Um, well, to keep it really quick, my favorite scene in Xanadu is the, when Sunny Malone is skating down the the street to the mall in the background and he comes across Kira on the mall and he just like skates really hard into it. Like how did that, like, how did you do that? Well, I didn't actually go through a wall. Uh, but, uh, you, know, it, 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 you know, in filming, you know, you have different angles. So there's a camera behind me that looks at that wall and then there's a camera here that comes in close that looks at Sunny preparing to do it. And then there's, you know, a tracking shot, you know, with the cameras on, you know, 
on a, like a railroad track, and it follows him running, skating really fast. But, you know, oh, where I'm skating to, that wall isn't there. And then they shoot back, and then they get a process kind of thing where they show the character going through the wall. So it's a, you know, it's a multi-step kind of thing, but when you see it, it looks like, ah, he's now gone in to, you know, to see the, you know, all the Greek gods and Roman gods and all gods of the world. No, <laughs> thank you. Last question. Thank you again for coming. Uh, we know of your romance on the set, obviously, between you and your young wife. Were you able to tell, see any of the romance between Olivia and Matt, and how long did you have to work with Dominic in the studios for the animated sequence? She wanted to know about the relationship between Matt and uh, Olivia, and then animations. Okay. Um, if a blind man had been on that set, he or she, well, he, my man, would have been able to pick that up. It was that obvious, that quick. <laughs> uh, you know, and that was a, you know, just, you know, a beautiful guy, a really wonderful uh, man. And, you know, that happened pretty early on. And it was, like I say, it was, it was noticeable. <laughs> but, you know, I hated that it didn't work out for them. Uh, the second question, the animation. The first I knew of animation is when I saw a screening of the movie and I thought, do I really? I know I've got a weird nose, but is it really that weird? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to wrap it up. But, um, um, as fast as you can, experience, I've just got to ask one Megaforce question. Sure. Your just overall experience of Megaforce. Good, bad, weird. What was that like? Well, you know, it was all of the above. Uh, I was not cast in the role, and the person that was cast in the role at the last minute uh, informed them that he was not going to do it. So my agent called me on Sunday, I still lived in New York then, and said, and then in those days they messengered things. There were, you know, somebody came in a bicycle and gave you a script, you know, bring your doorbell. So it wasn't like you could just go to your computer. This is 1981 or something like that. And uh, she said they made this offer, you know, uh, Jerry Reed was going to play this part, but he's got some kind of uh, music gig or something, so he's not going to do it. So I got the script, read the script, and they said, you got to be on a plane this afternoon. You know, so she negotiated a really nice deal for me. <laughs> you know, when it's that late in the day, you can, you know, you can, your agent can take off the handcuffs. So that was nice. It, uh, it facilitated my wife's move from, uh, our move from uh, New York to, uh, to Los Angeles and buying our first house. So that, that was a great point. Uh, so I flew out there. Actually, I flew out on Monday morning. I had the script. I had to learn Dallas's opening intro thing, which was about a half, three quarters of a page long. Uh, kind of this, you know, nonsensical speech. He's kind of a nonsensical character. Uh, I got off the plane. They drove me from Las Vegas airport out to, you know, 45, 50 minutes away to the set. Threw on blue jeans, cowboy boots, and cowboy hat and skull shirt. And they said, roll on. So it was like, okay, here we go. This is like, you know, it, but it was easy. I mean, you know, Dallas was a good old boy. I grew up on a farm in Arkansas. How hard is that? <laughs> Just what a, what a pleasure. Let's, uh, let's give it up again for that.